so Jack and Tiffany, again, thank you very much uh, for agreeing to spend this time together. As I said, we are excited about the Patreon story. And in our work with you, we've actually just, quite frankly, each of the consultants who work with you were inspired. And all of our, and our firm has been inspired. So we look forward to this discussion. Um, maybe to start it off, Jack, um, maybe give us an idea of how was the idea of diversity, equity, and inclusion built into Patreon's purpose from the beginning? Um, it, I, I think it, it, it kind of is, you know, at, at the core of, of where the idea came from. I mean, um, as a creator myself, when I made a music video that got a million views from uh, this excited, passionate community full of energy and enthusiasm with comments and, and compliments and people hanging with each other and watching this thing that I made, um, you know, when I sort of looked at that, the energy associated with creating something like that, and then my ad revenue check um, from, you know, from that, from the impact of that work, um, I got paid less than two hundred dollars for this video that I that took me three months of my life, cost me ten thousand uh, dollars. You know, I maxed out two credit cards along the way, and my fans freaking loved it. It was the best thing I'd ever made in my life. It was a, it was the best, highest quality most badass music video I'd ever made. And I got paid less than 200 bucks. Um, and it had a massive impact. You know, a million people saw it. Now the video is up to two and a half million people who have watched this video. And that's not fair. Hmm. That's not fair to creative people. It's, it's, it's not the world I want to live in. It's not the world creators want to live in. It's not the world fans want to live in. It's an unfair world. It doesn't value people. And, um, and that's, that's where Patreon's mission comes from. That's where the company comes from. Um, it is that purpose. You know, P Patreon is in many ways a, a, a tool. It is, it is a method. Um, but at the, at the core is a problem. It's a problem about, um, uh, about, uh, fairness and equitability for creative people and making sure that they are um are treated like the creative wonderful human beings that they are and not skipped over um so i i would i would say that that <clears throat> that feeling and um purpose has been um at patreon's core ever since the beginning of the company and that's informed everything that we do um who we hire and the processes we create and the policies we write and um, uh, and uh, you know everything kind of stems from that core purpose and that it so resonates with me. It's definitely something that um, I think about um, certainly on the people side of this business. Um, I think at its core, just the the two beliefs that really settle on us when we think about you know, how would you build a philosophy around it is one, this idea of opening up equal access. Um, that's such a core part to what we want to provide for our creators so that they have the monetization that they need, that they have the longevity that they, that they need and recognizing that the market isn't necessarily an equal playing field today and that this is something that hugely democratizes that um, for growth and longevity of creative people. Um, I think the second, you know, core belief um, that I think Jack also alluded to is that there really isn't any limit on creativity and creators. Um, we really honor creation in all of its forms and all of its identities, which is also a key mantra for thinking about diversity and inclusive uh, representation. So I definitely think that there are so many overlays with sort of our core purpose and how that can inform um, the opportunity that we have to think about our internal philosophy and maybe how that even plays out um, down the road into social impact and other areas that get us really excited. Thank you. That is really helpful because I think there are two things we want to branches that come from that. And maybe Jack, start with you. Maybe help us understand how that purpose, and I, it really resonates with me, an organization that was built about equity, an organization that was built about inclusion from the beginning, an organization that was just by its nature of creativity has diversity embedded into it, that overall purpose. How does that influence decision-making at, at every level? So that's one of the things we wanna talk about. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yeah, I, I think a big 
piece of it, if, if I had to kind of offer one, one um, headline for, for how it's influenced decision-making, um, you know, great ideas come from everywhere. And acknowledging that and building systems to surface those great ideas and building a culture and behaviors so that great ideas aren't squashed, um, but have the ability to rise from anywhere. <clears throat> That's, you know, such an important part of, of how, you know, how companies operate and how we design companies. Um, so um, that involves everything from how you talk to people in meetings and how we talk to each other um, in meetings. Um, <clears throat> everything from that um, to, you know, how do you prioritize um, solutions and, and what are the systems around, you know, prioritizing those solutions and who is responsible for those decisions. Um, I'll say that the difficult part of this um, is that I think it's really important to have very clear decision making at an organization. <laughs> and that usually means one specific decider for one specific problem. What you don't want to do is have democratized decision making where we vote on issues and the most popular thing wins. Um, that's a terrible way to run a company. Um, and at the same time, I think it's really important to make sure that we're listening and that people are hearing what everyone has to say um, and that all those ideas surface and get heard. And then we prioritize and then there's a clear DRI, a, you know, directly responsible individual who makes a decision and, and picks a path forward. Um, getting that balance, I think, is the tricky part. It's easy to say, oh, great ideas should come from everywhere. <laughs> um, what's, what's hard is to, to run a, a good, efficient, fair process that's not based on voting, <laughs> but is also um, based on making sure that, that the company is um, getting the best ideas from the entire organization. We want to make sure now more than ever that people feel really grounded in what they can expect at Patreon. What do we expect from each other? And again, I think our culture won't be right for every person who applies. And that's great. Um, that's fine. I think what we want to do is lead with that clarity so that people recognize what they're signing up for, because we know that our experience will match that. So how do we make sure that we drive maximum clarity around that? And so we want to celebrate folks who can bring in, when we speak of purpose, everything that we heard, people who are like really excited about being a part of this incredible mission. And they also are bringing the craft and the experience that we need to really up-level the work that we're trying to do. But they also have to have this relentless like passion for learning um, and self-development and growth and fearlessness about running towards the, the new problems of the day. We're building stuff that hasn't been created yet. Like no one has created it. And so um, it's up to us to really solve for that. So you have to have that learning mindset and openness to like, I might be wrong. I might be putting myself out there. We might turn that into an L today and a W tomorrow and that's fine, but we need to go after it as well as being in this community where it's not just about myself and my own ego, but really thinking about the success of my team, um, making space for others with an inclusive mindset. The, there, there, there are a number of threads around uh, that you say being creative and authentic, right? <laughs> and genuine, right? And, and, and clear about the organization, about how you define things. I think that actually resonates. That said, a lot of organizations, you know, you know, we'll call it legacy. <laughs> we're necessarily built with, you know, diversity, equity, and inclusion. I mean, you were built, as Jackie said from the beginning, around equity and around inclusion and around creators, right? And, and by nature, creators are diverse. They weren't built that way, right? But what would you advise leaders who organizations didn't, weren't built that way, but how do they now embed it? And th this is really a question for both of you, you know, Jack and, and Tiffany. What advice would you give to leaders of other organizations that weren't built that way? About how do you embed these things into their core? How do you bring it back? Well, <laughs> oh gosh, that is such a hard question. I feel totally, I mean, to tell you the truth, I feel unqualified to, to give advice as a CEO of a 300 person company who's a first time founder and first time operator to, to give advice to CEOs who are operating at that scale of you know, thousands of employees and, and, uh, and billions in revenue. 
Um, so at, at, uh, at the risk of, of talking totally out of turn, um, maybe, maybe one thing that I would just offer uh, that's been a consistent lesson for me, I've just, I feel like I've learned over and over. I think, you know, leading by example is, is a great way mm -hmm. to kind of get started at least. And for me, the, the, you know, uh, I think the core of it is, is leading by being yourself, being who you are. It is such a trite thing to even say that. And I feel silly saying, be yourself. It sounds like the type of, you know, two cent advice that, that everybody dishes out. Um, but I'll, I'll give you some examples of <clears throat> uh, hard lessons learned where I think being yourself um, is, is my takeaway. Uh, the first was in fundraising for Patreon. I remember early in the days when we were trying to raise a seed round of financing, we went out and, um, and for the, and I'm, I've been a creator for 10 years <laughs> and suddenly I'm going to meet these VCs and uh, pitch Patreon as a business to these investors. And so what did I do? I naturally buttoned myself up a bit and, you know, practice my, my best MBA speak and, uh, and went into these meetings, you know, trying to be somebody who was not me mm -hmm. and trying to put on an image of a of a business leader who had it together and that's not what it was in the beginning it was not this beautiful strategic thing we're going to build this massive company it's gonna, that was not what we set out to do and it wasn't who we were and it wasn't who i was um i was a creator solving a problem for myself and when I went out to pitch Patreon as an MBA, it fell totally flat. By the way, I'm not an MBA. I'm saying like, I tried to put that on. It fell flat. Nobody bought it. I went in pitching cohorts and decks and metrics and all this shit that I didn't really understand at the time and, I, and wasn't why we were doing it. And I think something about the whole pitch just didn't resonate like that. And then finally, I got some advice after I told people where the company really came from, I got some advice to just tell people the real story. And I went in and I told them the story of making this robot music video that cost me 10 grand and maxing out two credit cards and spending my life savings to make this replica of Millennium Falcon with these two hexapod robots that walk out of rotating elevators. And then we all fist pump to the beat of the music and our crazy creators in my bedroom, which sounds like an insane pitch to give a table full of investors. <laughs> But I did that and it was like magic. Suddenly everybody saw where the company was coming from, why it mattered to me, what problem we were solving in the world, why I was passionate about it. And we filled our funding immediately. The round was oversubscribed. And my takeaway from that moment, as try as it is, was the importance of being honest to myself and to others about who I am and why I'm doing what I'm doing. Um, being yourself, that was my takeaway. Um, I'll give you one more moment, a more painful one that I remember. And I won't get into details here, but as Patreon was scaling, um, I got advice that I needed to be a bit more, um, of a hard ass, maybe, like reprimanding. And I was reading all these books at the time about, you know, okay, there's these types of CEOs and they're really, you know, they're really tough. And, you know, I need to be more tough was like this thought that I had. And, um, and so I put on this kind of tough, I, try, I tried it because I have a growth mindset and I want to evolve as a leader and I want to grow and I want to be open to new ideas. And I thought, okay, I'll, I'll, tr I'll try that and see if that gets better results. And I, um, fuck, I regret that. It's not who I am. And it misses the nuance and the point of leadership that, that I've learned since then, which is I believe it's possible to be direct and clear and also warm and compassionate. And those are not trade-offs. You don't have to trade one for the other. You can be direct and clear and say the truth and what you want, and you can say this missed expectations, and you can say this, this 
particular thing is not up to par and we need to do it better next time. And you can do all that and be warm and kind and a good person and have generosity of spirit. Those things are not mutually exclusive. And that's who I am. I, I'm, I'm, I'm both of those things. I want to be a leader who is both of those things. And, and, um, and yeah, I, I misinterpreted this advice and tried on this personality that wasn't me in this, in this one meeting. And when I think about it, I'm just like so angry at myself for doing that. Those are the hard moments where I, I really learn about what it means to be myself. Um, and so, you know, I, I, I guess for, for leaders who are, you know, thinking about how to build organizations where others are encouraged to be themselves and to bring themselves, people talk about bringing your full self to work. Um, easy thing to talk about, hard thing to do. I think it starts with the leader who is who they are at work. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and that encourages others to be the same. There is a um, poem by Paul Lawrence Dunbar uh, that I lived my life by early on, the creator early on from the Harlem Renaissance, which was called We Wear the Mask. And those people who had succeeded, you know, like me, it looked like me, you know, thought we were going to needed to succeed and, and, and in the world needed to wear a mask and not be themselves. So I uh, appreciate that when you're not yourself, you don't really fully succeed and bring your whole self. So thank you. Um, Tiffany, maybe we'd we'll love to hear your thoughts around, you know, how leaders can actually position themselves to be attractors of talent, right? In, in, in this world of, as they're growing, when it comes to DNA. Your thoughts? Yeah. So much of what Jack said deeply resonates. And I think, the best uh, framing that I've used in multiple organizations ties back to that, which is authenticity. Um, you have to have an authentic approach to DEI that matches your company's identity. Um, it feels like, and especially in these years um, where there's been a lot more conversation around having healthy, um, diverse and inclusive um, practices and organizations that we've sort of taken best practices, which are awesome, drop ship them in the organization, and then hope becomes our strategy that they take root and take life and that they can transform. And the practices are amazing. So every practice, there's always something that we can learn and think about how to incorporate it. But there has to be an authentic view and perspective on what DNI and and equity what does that mean for your organization and why does that matter and no two organizations are the same and so i think that authenticity of how DNI helps to um, further your brand and further your mission that's really important work that has to be sort of at the at the front of the train and then everything else sort of comes behind it and so you know, if I take Patreon as an example, we talked about at the very top, we have these two key beliefs and those two key beliefs have to be at the root of all of the practices that we then attach with it and the mindset that we're trying to build in the organization. So this idea of equal access um, has got to be a part of this and how we think about um, creating equality internally and externally. This idea of um, no limit to creativity and creators means that we need that diversity. So that means that we need that diversity um, internally as well as externally. And those two orientations are our story and they don't need to be someone else's. But I think that that really then informs how we want to approach the work. Where might we spend the time? Where might we see that we have some blind spots that we really want to go after and help to think about putting practice around? So I think that kind of understanding what the why is for the organization and why that matters and how that helps to further, to me, feels like always the right place to start the work. And then I think from there, that's when you do the honest assessment of like, to what extent are we living up to this? Where do we see receipts that say, hey, this is who we are? Where do we see disconnects that say, hey, for us, that feels even weirder that we haven't done X, Y, Z. And so you get to do some of that kind of self-reflection. And then that helps you then come away with which of these awesome practices that are out there that we should really be doubling down on. And maybe there might be some where you want to lean double because it's truly an expression of who you are. And so I think that work to me has always informed how I think about 
where, you know, where to start and where to go and then how far you want to go and how do we sh get collective mind share around the, the solutions that we're going after. And we're sort of, you know, starting this work and it's been really nice um, coming in at a time where we got to work on the employee value proposition and the core behaviors. And now we're at the stage where um, we're sitting down and starting to codify what this means. What does inclusion mean with this really firm grasp on our mission and employee value proposition? So look forward to like all the building that we're going to be doing together with that in mind. Thank you. This this has been a great discussion. Uh, we, we, we really appreciate it. I think there are a number of things that, that resonate. When, as we've been advising clients, we tell them that, you know, should think about moving the needle when it comes to and actually having impact, to use your term, genuine impact, uh, uh, as an organization or having a purposeful organization, um, that you really have to just do three things, right? One, one is define it. Define why diversity, define why equity and inclusion are, are important for your organization. There's an articulation piece. I think, Jack and Tiffany, you've done that well. This is what it means for Patreon. You, you, you have to link it to your talent and business strategy. And quite frankly, you've done that. You are doing that and living that daily. And to some extent, you have to measure impact and adjust as Tiffany, as you said, what works, what doesn't. There are frameworks for everything. There are initiatives for everything. What, 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 what works for us and how we measure the impact of that over time. So I, I applaud you, by the way, for doing it. And I think doing all of that with, uh, in an authentic way, in, in a genuine way, is, is important. And I think doing all those things help you actually position your organization to be attractors of top talent over time. And we look forward to uh, the journey with you. Mm -hmm.